Thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, appreciate it. Good afternoon. Um, uh, and before my time as secretary comes to a close, um, uh, I wanted to come here and brief you and uh, do so as always with the, the chairman at this time of transition uh, about what the, uh, the Department of Defense is doing to stand ready to confront the nation's uh, security challenges anywhere in the world, as we always do and must do. Today we had a meeting of the Senior Leadership Council, and I, I therefore met with the department's most senior um, civilian and uniformed leaders from every combatant command and every one of the armed services, and from some of our uh, partners to discuss how we're ensuring continued preparedness and vigilance in the weeks and the months ahead. Uh, we also discussed how we're continuing to confront our five major, unique, evolving, rapidly evolving challenges we face around the world. General Scaparati, to begin with, discussed the steps we're continuing to take to counter the prospect of Russian aggression and coercion, particularly in Europe, uh, where we're standing strong with our NATO allies, and SCAP specifically updated us on the arrival in the past few days of the ships carrying the tanks and fighting vehicles of our rotational armored brigade combat team uh, and his plans to quickly move the entire brigade eastward in the next few weeks, uh, plans that have we've been uh, set in motion some months ago. Um, Admiral Harris and the PACOM team reviewed how we're continuing to manage historic change in the Asia Pacific, the single most consequential region for America's future even as we strengthen our deterrent and defense forces in the face of North Korea's continued nuclear and missile provocations. General Votel gave an update on what we're doing to check Iranian aggression and malign influence in the Gulf and to help defend our friends and allies in the Middle East. And of course, he briefed on how we're accelerating the certain defeat of ISIL's can the ISIL cancer's parent tumor in Iraq and Syria. And there, our coalition and local partners are continuing to achieve significant results. Uh, in these last few days, the Iraqi security forces have reached the Tigris River in Mosul, and our Syrian coalition partners are converging down on Raqqa, all the while coalition forces continue to hunt down ISIL leaders. And then General Robinson discussed NORAD NORTHCOM's continued cooperation with our domestic intelligence and law enforcement partners to help protect our homeland and our people. The many other senior leaders here today contributed to this morning's productive, robust discussion. The meeting was another reminder that while the, that while the world doesn't rest for the transition here in Washington, neither does the Department of Defense. American people here at home and our friends around the world uh, can have confidence and our adversaries should take heed that the U.S. military is full speed ahead in the coming weeks and months. The Senior Leadership Council is also a reminder of why I feel confident in DOD's ability to meet these challenges and, that, that, and those the future will present as well. Around the conference room earlier today, there were some of the finest men and women America has to offer. Like all those Americans serving around the world right now, each of our leaders is dedicated to defending this country, making a better world for our children. Our military, the finest fighting force the world has ever known, has so many strengths, technological, material, operational experience, and more, but another is its leaders. America's military deserves only the finest leaders, and we've got them, whether in the Joint Chiefs, our combatant commands are in the service, as each of them, I know, will continue to make an important and lasting contribution to the future of our military. So will the Marine to my left, General Joe Dunford. I said it yesterday, I'll say it again today. Recommending Joe Dunford to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was the best decision I made as Secretary of Defense. Joe, you've been a great partner, helping me lead the department, our joint force, and advising and supporting the President in accelerating the counter-ISIL campaign, reforming our department to better confront trans-regional and trans-functional challenges, and much, much more. And I have every confidence you'll continue to defend our country and protect our values with excellence in the years to come. And of course, the President 
the Pentagon Press Corps represents one of those values and also upholds one of those values that we defend. Free and vibrant press is essential to our democracy and the protection of it. I've known many of you for a long time. And uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate your efforts, consistent efforts to tell the world about our men and women in uniform, our dedicated civilians, and what they're doing every day to defend our country and make a better world. I respect your commitment to getting the job done, getting the story right, getting it to your audience as quickly as possible. Uh, and if, even when we don't give you all the filing time you'd like, I, Lita, if you're listening, I. Uh, apologies for that, uh, but I wish you good luck and Godspeed in the years ahead. Thanks for your hard work and your dedication. With that, I know the chairman has a few words, and then we'll take your questions. Hey, thanks, Mr. Secretary. Hey, first of all, uh, to Bob Burns. Bob, on behalf, I get the chance on behalf of the secretary and I to uh, to wish you a happy birthday. Uh, and. Uh, no, 38 I, long years. That's right. And, and I understand that's about 80 percent of the reason why we're here this afternoon, so thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you were kind. I, I just, we had a uh, farewell, I think most of you know, yesterday uh, for the Secretary, but it was really not just for his uh, two years as the Secretary. Yes, this caps really uh, almost four decades of, of service to the Department in, uh, in just about every capacity. And, Mr. Secretary, it's our last uh, public appearance together. So I want to thank you on behalf of the force uh, for your leadership, first and foremost. I mean, there's many things we could talk about, the ISIL campaign, putting the department on a path to capability development that will make us maintain a competitive advantage in the future, uh, how hard you've worked to maintain deep partnerships uh, and, and improve our alliances uh, around the world. But at the end of the day, it's been the compassion and the care that you've had for our men and women in uniform and, uh, and the fact that you've been all about winning that I think we'll remember most. And so I just want to, in, in our last time together, just say uh, thanks very much for your leadership, sir, your partnership, and for giving me an opportunity to, to make a difference with you. Thanks, Joe. And with that, I think we'll be prepared to take questions. Birthday boy, yeah, first question. Secretary, uh, a question for both of you about one of the topics you refer to, I think, as the big five problems mm -hmm. that the country faces, uh, North Korea. Um, if and when North Korea does launch, test launch an ICBM, sh would the U.S. or should the U.S. attempt to shoot it down, not because it poses a physical threat necessarily, but in order to deny North Korea the technical advancement it needs to, to move toward its ultimate goal of being able to hold the U.S. territory at risk? Um, uh, if, if the missile is threatening, uh, it will be intercepted. If it's not threatening, we won't necessarily do so. Uh, and because it may be more to our advantage to, first of all, save our interceptor inventory, and second, to um, uh, gather intelligence from the flight uh, rather than do that when it's not uh, threatening. And Joe, you think that? No, Bob, that's, that's where I'd be as well. Uh, okay, Barbara. Um, General Dunford, I'd like to start with you and then, Mr. Secretary. Sir, you once testified before Congress that you saw Russia as a, in your words, as a possible existential threat and that their behavior was alarming, in your words. So I want to ask you today, what alarms you as the chairman about Russian behavior? <coughs> what advice do both of you have for the American people about whether they should trust Vladimir Putin? Those two questions, and then I would like to follow up by also asking you what you both think the chances are of capturing or killing Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi before the Obama administration leaves office. Okay. Uh, you want me to start? Uh, okay. Um, well, first of all, let me start. I'll do it Russia and then, then Baghdadi. Uh, with respect to uh, Russia, uh, I've been very clear we have our serious differences. Uh, with Russia. It's not a question of alarm. It's a matter of strategic judgment. Uh, we've had a uh, serious uh, concerns about their activities in Ukraine. Uh, I've ex uh, said clearly I think their uh, activities in Syria have been backwards and counterproductive. Um, and 
uh, at the same time, we've worked productively with Russia in, with respect to North Korea and with respect to Iran. Uh, and therefore, uh, our approach to Russia is one that is both strong and balanced. Strong in the sense that we're making investments uh, specifically to, w with an eye to being able to continue to check and deter Russia and also making investments in our alliance uh, in NATO so that they can stand strong against against Russian aggression. Balanced, let me, let me just finish and I'll get to you. Balanced in the sense that we should, we with Russia and everybody else, continue to look for opportunities where we can make our interests align. Uh, they have not been abundant uh, in recent years, but I remember a time, uh, Barbara, and I've worked quite closely uh, with Russia, but I've done it at a time when it would serve U.S. interests because I could make our interests and Russia's interests uh, uh, align. Um, with respect to, and, and so here as in strategy and foreign policy, uh, generally, uh, it, it's not a matter of trust, it's a matter of U.S. interests and the pursuit of U.S. interests. Uh, with respect to Baghdadi, I'll, I'll only say this, I, I think if I were Baghdadi or any other ISIL leader, I would be quite concerned about my safety. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask you again, following on your previous remarks to Congress, sure. What alarms you today about Russia? Yeah, Barbara, uh, as I think you can appreciate from a military perspective, I focus more on the capabilities than I do their intent, I'm not trying to project their intent. And so when I made that statement, I looked at the modernization of the nuclear enterprise and their public statements about the use of nuclear weapons. I looked at their cyber activities and their development of cyber capabilities. Uh, I looked at what they were doing for space and anti-space, their maritime capability. And then, you know, what I also looked at was what I describe as uh, adversarial competition that has a military dimension short of conflict. That's where they've used political influence, economic coercion, unconventional operations, military posture to actually undermine uh, our alliance structure uh, in our partnerships in Europe. So that's, that probably, to me, is one of the big concerns. The Secretary mentioned Ukraine. We saw similar activity in Georgia. We saw similar activity in the Crimea. We see similar activity in the Baltic states. Missy. Uh, hi, Missy Ryan from The Washington Post. Um, I have two questions, um, one for you, Secretary Carter. Um, lawmakers, including Senator McCain, have called the Russian hacking activity an act of war, suggesting that it requires a more aggressive response. Do you agree with that assessment, and do you think that the U.S. response to the hacking activity has been inadequate? Um, and General Dunford, I'd like to ask you about the civilian casualties issue um, in Iraq and Syria. And um, the new administration has suggested that it might intensify the bombing campaign, and I know you don't want to comment on future policy, but given that military officials have said that after the acceleration of the air campaign last year that they were hitting everything they could um, that wouldn't incur civilian casualties, is your judgment that <coughs> can the air campaign be intensified without killing more civilians? Well, uh, with respect to uh, the uh, Russian hacking issue, I, I'm, I don't have anything to add to what the FBI and the intelligence community have said in the report. They obviously did a meticulous uh, uh, job of analyzing the data. They've reported their conclusions uh, uh, quite clearly. I think they just as clearly call for a, a response. Um, and. Uh, uh, here, that response can be across a broad range. It doesn't have to be a, that is a similar response. It is a cyber uh, response. Uh, uh, res some responses have been made. Um, I uh, think you should regard that as a start and not the end, uh, or as I've said before, a floor and not a uh, ceiling. You, d you don't want to comment on whether it's an act of war or not? Well, I think whatever you call it, it's an aggressive act. Missy, I'm having a hard time answering your question directly because, to me, the pace of our bombing is driven by the pace of operations uh, of our partners on the ground. So we're providing air support that's consistent with uh, the progress of the Iraqi security forces in the case of Iraq. I think last year, about this time, you can remember we had a conversation about why isn't the, op why isn't the air campaign have high tempo. 
And we said the Iraqi security forces uh, aren't conducting operations at a high tempo, and that's going to drive uh, greater air support. That's what happened in Ramadi about this time last year. That's what's happening right now uh, in Mosul and the surrounds. And the same thing is true in Syria. The, op the tempo of our air campaign in Syria is directly uh, linked to the pace of our operations in the Syrian Democratic Forces that we're supporting. So uh, the issue of civilian casualties, I mean, someone puts that in there as though that's the driver of the air campaign. I guess what I tell you is, no, that's not been the driver of our air campaign. The driver of the air campaign has been our ground partners, and it will remain so. You could intensify. You could potentially accelerate or the, increase the The air summer. campaign will accelerate as the operations of our partners accelerate. Bill. Um, Secretary, uh, your counterpart in Russia, uh, Defense Minister Shoigu, uh, came out with some remarks today uh, saying the United States had not only uh, achieved a, a, a zero result in Syria, I think he said the words, his words were, uh, it's had a negative result in Syria. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, looking ahead to uh, another administration which wants to partner with, uh, with Russia, potentially in Syria, um, how, do you, how do you see that relationship? But what, are the, what are the possibilities for improvement? And, and to, to the chairman, if it possible, you were in Congress uh, last year about the, uh, the, the dangers of sharing intelligence with Russia. Uh, how has your thinking uh, evolved in these many months, especially as U.S. and Russian forces have come into greater proximity just to do the uh, evolution of the campaign? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm realistic about uh, uh, our concerns about Russian behavior, not just in Syria, but I've also spoken about uh, Europe as well. Uh, I've also said that it's, it stands to reason and has long been American practice with respect to Russia and other countries that we would cooperate and align ourselves with other countries when and if their conduct and their interests made that in our uh, national interest. Uh, there haven't been a lot of opportunities. Uh, in the last uh, uh, number of years. I, again, I told, told you I remember a time when it was different. And, of course, we'd all like to see a time re uh, uh, return, but that would require behavior on the Russian part that was more congruent with our interests. You certainly haven't seen that in Syria. I said that. You certainly haven't seen that in Europe. Phil, actually, a very similar answer. Last year when I, when I spoke about intel sharing, it was based on my assessment of uh, a misalignment of our objectives and our priorities in Syria. And so unless, on that, unless that would change, then I wouldn't see a change in my recommendation in terms of intel sharing. Uh, okay. Hans. Yeah. Um, will we, can we expect any more Guantanamo transfers uh, in the next nine days now? And then a second part, you both have been speaking about the role in Turkey and Russia. Did the, did the Turks, and uh, Mr. Secretary, you spoke about this a lot on that trip, on the importance of constant communication with your Turkish counterparts. Did the Turks inform you that they would be working with the Russians on Abba? Um, well, with respect to the second, I'll let the chairman